It was one year, Father. I'm not sure you had moved to Kansas City yet. Maybe you had uh, the 31st building, the, like behind the altar, this giant like leak happened or something like that on the procession of the cross. And uh, they had to like move the altar out oh, no. from behind like the iconostasis, you know, like so it was out. Yeah. And uh, Father Justin was talking at the time and he's like, yeah, I call Father Alexi, like, what do I do? And Father Alexi's like, well, sounds like it's a good day to celebrate the procession of the cross. Welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight, I was going to ask if you guys did any good celebrity impersonations. But then I was like, let's not do that unless you guys got one off the off the cuff. No? All right. That's fine. That's fine. Father, I think you could do a very good uh, uh, Forrest Whitaker from Rogue One. <laughs> because the when he's like standing up in the tower, just like they're all looking at him and he's like lies deception and just like freaking out it's just like yeah i can see a little bit of father in that i mean i just i chuckled because my first like five years being here i didn't go a, I didn't go two two three days without someone saying force whitaker just like force whitaker it was just like force i mean and then i just wish i had a card that i could just hand out what because my reply is i wish i had his money I wish I had his money. Yeah, so I just, yeah. you know. See, and, okay, this is this is interesting. But you know who I really look like? I don't look like. I could show you someone. Lord have mercy. Uh, I'm gonna shoot this to you, okay. and you're gonna lose your mind. Well, should, should I pull it up? Can I pull up this person's name? Is this a celebrity? Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh gosh, what is his name? What's he in? Or what does he do? He's an a hip hop artist. Uh, oh gosh, I'm killing me over here. Um, he does this thing with a shrimp parma. Shrimp uh, parma? Yeah. It's it's so like it, it's I mean, that's got to come up. Even even like. For me, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, it was, it's, it's wild. It's, it's a wild. video? Yeah. Uh, oh gosh, what is, I forget the dude's name. It's been years. I remember I, I was even showing like one of my kids once and they're like, Dada. <laughs> I love, yeah. My kid literally thought it was me. Uh Oh, oh gosh, what's the dude's name, dude? Oh, my while God. you're thinking about this, yeah. I just want to make it clear: I didn't go off that based off of looks. You do look a little bit like Forrest Whitaker, I guess. It really hit me when I was watching Andor, the show. I was Wait, like, "That's father." And, yeah, I, you said Rogue One at first. Rogue One, I, was I like, saw it a little in bit. Rogue One is he in Rogue One? Yeah, yeah, no, he's in, he's Rogue, in Rogue One. One. Yeah. Is he? Yeah, he's standing at like the top of the Nathan, tower. Nathan with... Lauren. What is it? I just Nathan mayhem. Nathan mayhem. Lauren? Mayhem. Mayhem Lauren? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, dude. <laughs> I don't I don't think so. Can you pull up a picture? Is, yes, I'm gonna pull up a picture. But I mean I, the, but thing I'm... Is, the thing is see this uh... one. This is maybe all you if, ever his, maybe if his like, facial hair was a little different. This is all you've ever known. There was a point in time when I was maybe if the facial hair was more. different. <laughs> is this this is the this Oh is no, I can see it. One hundred percent. Oh yeah, I could see it. I could yeah, see but it. I could see that it. That one specifically, that meh. That yeah, one with the Well, you go back the one with the with the denim shirt. 
Yeah, with the denim shirt, one hundred percent. That's I was like, yeah, there you go. That looks yeah, like a little him. bit. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I just showed you the video, or whatever. I sent that to. I mean, it, it's just I, even I was kind of like, oh, okay, okay. That, I mean, yeah, right there. That looks like father. I could maybe see it. Yeah, I could maybe see it. If I had like an evil East Coast brother, yeah, that's like the father from another dimension that I would say has a goatee, but you already have a goatee, kind yeah. of like so. But there's this I mean, one. Can we does. find him with the? Can we find him with the jewel encrusted Jesus piece? Then that would be like the inversion. That's the one. The I just father, sent it to you. I sent the it to father you the inversion. But there, there's that one where he's just like he does this whole thing, and I don't know. He wearing an onk in this one. Like no, this one got, down he here. See that one down there? Uh, it's one? the second. It's third row, second shot. This one. A second. Oh shot. yeah. Yeah. The yellow bowl. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. I can definitely okay, that's I can the clip. see it. So I just sent you guys the, 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 video the of Kooji that. sweater. That's There's old a whole right clip there. of him like talking about it. And that's the it, that's the that's the shrimp parmesan. Yeah. Right his right his whole cadence and stuff like that. I mean it's definitely Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. I can okay. see it. All right. All but right. see, that actually is an interesting question because someone asked me who would you get to play you in a movie? And I actually think I crushed it with my answer for me. I think um, uh, Shia LaBeouf. Like, I think Shia yeah. LaBeouf would be like, not yeah, and not just that. not just looks, because yeah. looks is not what I'm talking about. Same with the Forrest Whitaker thing. This is what I was saying. It was like his mannerisms from the show Andor. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's father. Because, like, he was, like, very, like, mm-hmm. What? No, dude. I, I think I think a real a, like even a modestly good uh, movie makeup artist could make Shia LaBeouf look like you. Yeah, oh, for sure. Like I, even a modestly good one. Could sure. And I think like yeah. the mannerisms too. Like yeah, so exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I and then we were talking about my wife who who would could play my wife, and I was like, it can't just be about looks. And I ended up with um, I can never remember. She's from Lady Bird and from a Grand Budapest Hotel. She's that Irish actor. She's huge right now. I can't remember her name. And people will be saying it in the description whatever, or in the comments. It doesn't really matter. But um, it, it's not even really about looks. It's like, can she nail the mannerisms? Yeah. And I think like the short Irish angry. Not Tilda, not Tilda Swindon. N- no, 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 no. Who, it's like the main lady from the, Lady Bird. She's the ancient one, isn't she? Yeah, yes, she, is. Yeah, she is. She is she the is, ancient she is. one. She is. No, yes, I that's that's and Cyprian's not, easy. We just get we just get his evil cousin Andrew. Yeah, I was gonna say it wouldn't be hard to cast Cyprian. Um, I would uh maybe uh, like say sour si, yeah. si, series Ronin. Yep, sour Sariza Sariza. Yeah, Ronin? I'm not even gonna try, okay. yeah, but Rocky? yeah, I think she no, would sour, be the actor. Sour sauerkraut, Racha, Circe, Circe, Sourze. How, somebody, what a weird name! How is that pronounced? Wow, that's very uh. Sourza, Sourza. Yeah. Sours, Sourza, Sourza. You just put brown curly hair on her, and mm-hmm. like, and if she's just a little bit like sassy and a little bit angry, and has like a whole bunch of kids falling around her all the time. That's Sorsi, my wife. Sorzy Ronan explains yeah. how to pronounce her name. Oh, I'm not. Gonna yeah, do, I can't. So it won't show anyway, it won't show, it won't but the actual the song, the actual question I'm going to ask, we're going to put all this aside. Is there are there any Protestant songs like worship songs that still like get you? You know what I mean? They're still like, like ooh, that's still my really whole good. my whole uh, solid state um, bass down catalog. I, mean, yeah. I still listen all the face down record stuff, sleeping giant stuff. I mean, man, um, they got this one song, Rain, uh, R E I G N, you know, like, R- oh, not G, R E I N, right? Um, man, so good. Yeah, so good. who's it by? Sleeping Giant. It's Sleeping Giant. Oh, man, so good. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Um, what about you, Cipri? Kipper Crab. Oh, we don't got time for Cipri. I'll, I'll keep going. 
Kimper oh, that's good. Man, Kimper Crab. Oh boy, Kimper Crab. He, I love Kimper Crab. He did this album in the seventies, proto psych space opera rock. His band Archangel, incredible. It, he's he brings in this high elvish. Baroque, like off world angelic high tongue thing. Wow. And mixes it with the best space opera. Just, it's incredible. And it's all like apocalyptic Jesus folk people music. Sure. So good. And then he turns around and he does his album, The Vigil, which is basically a, a theme album of a, a of a um, crusader mm. and like from the good side, like his, his night vigil um, before going to battle and dying and just talking about, you know, pledging his undying love to Christ. It's just, oh, wow. That's which crusade. Incredible. Incredible. Is he specific to which crusade father, or is it just a uh, general crusader? He's a, he's a crusader? That's cool. That's so, good. So good. Yeah. That's an, that's an album or a song. The, the album's called The Vigil. The, okay. the opening song is called The Vigil. And it's in- And is it is it a concept album or it's like the concept entire- album? It's oh, a concept wow. that album. That's so it's, interesting. It's- Man, I, I'm almost tempted to just start singing it right now for you. It's incredible. The lyrics well, it's are on my incredible. List now. It's on my inspiring. list. Inspiring. Um maybe put the, the link in. What's the guy's name? His name's Kemper Crab. Yeah. He does a K- Christmas album too, right? Oh, his Christmas album is incredible. I play it every year. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Kemper. Yeah. Christ's favorite color? Black. <laughs> it's so it's so good. Oh, Kemper Crab. I love it. Okay, I've got it. Crab. And then that other band that he did when he was younger was called Archangel. A-R-K. Just the greatest, just Jesus people, psych, space rock. And then it. just... It's a vigil full album. Yeah. It's incredible. 1982. So good. Wow. Yeah. He has this one song. I'm in. Talking about. um, Oh, gosh. He has a song from Noah's perspective. Talking Hmm. about when God closed the ark. He fell on. He's like, I fell down on my face and I worshiped you, Yahweh. It's just incredible. But the way he puts it down and just. The, the feelings of despair and all these things of feeling abandoned. Wow. It's like hearing all the people die outside the ark. But he's talking about like the guilty feels, but like, hey, you're the one who closed the door. Sure. You know what I mean? It's just, ooh. Wow, interesting. Oh, it's so good. He has this, man, you guys better shut me up. He's got this whole song. And like, you got you to take in mind what year this is, right? This is like- This is early 80s, right? Yeah, like an archangel was even earlier than the vigil. So 70s? I even know Ar- huh? 70s yeah Archangel's like 70s? 70s for sure wow and so there's this like it's got like the computer like six 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 like a computer sound man talking about the mark of the beast and everything but it's just like it's so it's before like like great planet earth and all that stuff yeah it's yeah, just, yeah 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 it's so just wow just good and he's a super good player man like oh he's just an incredible musician anyways i could just talk forever oh, i get it I get it. That's legit. Well, that's, I've, now, I've, that got, I've got something to listen to today. Yeah. Cyprian, what about you? Is there anything that you still. Oh, like? I, I feel like I shouldn't even. Well, I was never. I, I mean, I was never really particularly into. Oh, like, that's true. Christian yeah. music per se. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that actually like the first. I think the first even like Christian music that really grabbed me that was just overtly christian was honestly was probably uh kanye's jesus is king album mm-hmm. like it was that it was that late for me yeah but I, not, I mean i'm just running on with that i mean i'm not i'm not gonna turn that out and forgive me gonna... forgive me like i said i'm just it's one of those things i'm just gonna i'm just gonna own it today but i've been th- <laughs> i've been waiting all i've been waiting i was like i I can, I'm just going to throw this out and I'm just going to bounce and you guys can go on with the rest of the show. Because I've been waiting on this, right? I wanted to tell everybody about Fathomage and just... 
Oh, Wait, what is it? No, I gotta great. get the word out about Fathomage. I gotta get people to Fathomage. check them out. Like, oh okay. my gosh. So I don't sad. mean to be this guy, but his first album is like really good ambient, like oh, you're, you're with just this guy. little you're tiny kiss guy. of black metal. And I linked it into our music thread and literally, not at literally, okay. but like a bunch of people were like, what the heck is this? Pass. And I was just like, okay. How long ago was fine. that? It was like six months ago or something like that because someone from this show recommended them a long, long time ago. In the comments, it's like, you guys should check out Fathom Age. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go check this out. And so the one with the imprint of, of Christ's body uh -huh. on the shroud is like that is like an experimental like ambient with like a, just this little kiss of black metal and then there's like a, this little like electronic component to it some chant and stuff like that and i was like this is brilliant i threw it up in the music thread and then a couple of people were like i don't know what this I is and they just moved on it just like yeah, moved I on. Saw it. and then he had just released a black metal album in like 22 or something and that was a really good album too it was like i'm not even into black metal anymore or unblack metal or whatever it was like that's a really really good album like so i i'm just saying like that dude his his discography is solid like it's, it's solid incredible it's solid that doxology that like was the doxology con yeah he does the song of saint patrick oh yeah. man it's, it's all just super good baroque and just baroque. like baroque dude baroque, man fantastic and the fantastic. thing is people <laughs> see people don't know this about well people who know me know but like i'm a sucker for baroque i mean one of my favorite albums is sabbatum all the sabbath albums done in, in a baroque style it's like yeah yeah mm. just, oh sabbatum oh boy yeah interesting that is that's some deep fried biscuits yeah well the reviews on this fathomage on the this this new album i guess uh winters winters dawn yeah autumn's autumn's, 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 autumn's dawn, dawn winters, yeah. winter's that's darkness. the straight that's the unblack album it's really good like really if you're good. into that it's really really solid like i mean it's like getting like the reviews here seem to be really really good it's really good but even he has this one called like psalms of like reverence and something it's just wild because he's mixing these elements in a way that isn't forced or like awkward they just no. it works and it's just mm. he's very in touch with his inspiration he's not forcing anything no, he's not it's, trying it's to like very authentic and just yeah. like oh, it's very like yeah um I, well i've got some stuff to listen to today no that's good the, I, got, then, I got a lot of driving to do today so it's good okay well i mean that fathom age like especially like if you can make it through that first album i can't remember what it was called but it, it it's the uh, a listener from the show. I apologize. I forget who you are, but you recommended it, and I checked it out, and I loved it right away. I was like, "This is fantastic." That first album was what hooked me, and like mm -hmm. that's not common because usually I have to be appealed to musically, so I have to listen to the hits, and then I work my way into like mm -hmm. the deeper B sides, and like that's like I have I have to get some goodwill going for the group or the artist, whoever. Before oh, I start really? diving into the B sides, yeah. I mean, if you check, if you recommend a band to me, generally speaking, unless you pointed a certain album out to me or whatever, I go on Spotify, I find their most popular five tracks or whatever that they have up there, and I listen to those. I'm like, okay, cool. Now let's explore the rest of the stuff. But right away, I went to that obscure one, his like very first one, and I was like, this is awesome. I absolutely love this. Um, but and for the sake of moving on, because there is stuff we should talk. I like um, the um, Wayfaring Stranger. Like, generally, that song is always going to get me. Like, there's a couple versions of it I'm not crazy about. Um, and then this band, um, Showbread, they had this song called Matthias Replaces Judas. Uh, it's like off their mm. very first album. It's super emotionally manipulative. And but it, it's it's like a it's like what you think of when you think of like protestant worship music it's like very like mm. chill and calm and he's just like singing kind of just and mm. then the singer for a band a very popular christian Wait, what do you what do you mean by emotionally manipulative that's an interesting i've never heard someone describe music as emotionally manipulative so i'm interested yeah what does that mean you weren't protestant um or if you were it was I very was not. short yeah 
I mean, not so, not in, not like evangelical Protestant. Not not anybody who had worship music, right? That's a huge part of worship music. And Father's touched mm. on it before. Is it sounds like Coldplay because it's this yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's supposed to be this like it's supposed to bring you to this a certain emotional state. And people oh, it's think, sentimental. It's it's got it's sentimental. Yeah, it's sentimentality. It's appealing to sentimentality. I, it's just music that naturally it's a spell makes you want to like go like right. this, so, you know, like put your hands up, like in kind of like right. a worship thing. It's usually like knows exactly when to crescendo yeah. to like make you cry, to bring you to this like, and then you think well, it's, it's pop music. It's the pattern of pop music. It one hundred percent. It's yeah. the same thing as country. It's the same thing mm-hmm. as pop. It's the same thing as like any kind of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Mm-hmm. You're done. That's the structure of the music. But I just want to say this really quick. Go ahead. As the lead singer for another very popular Christian. Uh, third wave ska band called five iron frenzy and when he busts into that showbread song it's just like i'm instantly i'm emotionally manipulated but it's okay because it's like everything is like i'm a weak wretch i don't know anything christ Mm. you're everything you help me and everything and it's it's very very good um and then the um i had something else but that and wayfaring stranger those are the two Especially the the version of Wayfaring Stranger from 1917, the movie 1917 is just so like, ain't, oh, that's the last thing. It was any kind of like American bluegrass worship, like like songs about like suffering and salvation, like Angel Band mm-hmm. is fantastic. Like any kind of version of Angel Band, generally speaking, uh, the Christian stuff from Our Brother, Where Art Thou, that soundtrack, like a lot yeah, of those like yeah, nailed sure. a lot of like really good like southern bluegrass like hill people worship music and i just think that that's great as a missourian on some blind willie johnson yeah i mean like that that even of itself is cool cool because then you get that lo-fi like and so you get like that straight emotion like just like that straight like one take he recorded it that was that and that brings out this whole different aspect to it well anyway. i mean but that's it that's i mean culturally you're talking about a situation where there is there wasn't a dichotomy between like it's not it's not like there was music that wasn't fundamentally worship music you know what i mean mm, like there it had there to be was religious the, in in nature well it's it, well it's just that there was no divorcing of religion out of the cultural context like there was well, nothing the that you things. could do i mean that was that, one of the big things about like really like the beginnings of r&b mm-hmm. rock and exactly. roll and like exactly. is that it was like taking music that was quote unquote church music and secularizing it with the yeah, with yeah. the message that was like it was such a big like scandal like i mean you even get back to as late and i and i mean what i'm saying as late as someone like aretha franklin mm-hmm. because someone could say like no no that's early it's like no 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 her by the time aretha franklin was doing it and getting out, it was kind of like it had already had its movement. And so that's what I mean. But as late as Aretha Franklin, it was people were talking about it being a problem, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, and then but the, and then you have the seeping back in. Right. So like you have the, the divorcing correct. of the music from God mm-hmm. as, as secularizing, I think, is a, is, is a good way because it still mm-hmm. is worshiping a God. Right. Small mm-hmm. G God. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the music evolves in the secular context mm-hmm. and then. It re- and then the patterns of the secularized evolution go back into the church. So you wind up with like a Kirk Franklin or somebody like right. that. Right. Well, like the, doing it's the gospel world, music. Right. You that know. desire to emulate the world. Exactly. Which is, it, it begins to, which is, I mean, this is the whole thing too in regards of, <clears throat> you can see why. And this is this is an interesting thing. I mean, we're this is not where we're going to go, but I think this is. Something I think we can go down this direct down. This I mean, you know, related. one of the things in regards of like why some of us really struggle with um, Orthodox churches that will start bringing instrumentation, like organs and things like that, and you know, full disclosure, you know, I'm a closet goth. Everybody knows that. So it's like, oh, you know, organs and blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's great. You know, I love anything. Your that closet? Has that kind of, I thought well, you were I'm just goth. I'm not even in the closet. But, yeah, I was going to say. You know, it's just, <laughs> so, but that organ, that use of organ is a very different thing that we're talking about. But mm-hmm. I just think 
it's important to realize that like there's a reason why some of us are so resistant and we'll never will like die on that hill because we know what it does and we know what happens when instrumentation begins to i mean augustine talks about this saint augustine talks at length about this in regards of instrumentation and even he starts talking about melismatic chant and the need for it to not become um what essentially is like manipulative because Mm. the problem is that the content the logos of the worship begins to become divorced and so people begin to put the emphasis on the music and 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 how the effect of the music on the somatic portion of the person becomes dominant right so you, you don't even you're not even getting again the logos, the, the the word of what's being presented, the worship of it is is slowly getting eroded away. And that's why those of us who are coming out of the evangelical world, even if you wouldn't articulate it that way, you 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 know what we're talking about because everyone's felt it. Where it's like you I mean, every, like this this um experience of they their eyes are open and it's like Oh, this isn't even about God. This is just about me. I might as well be yeah. at a rock show. Yeah, and th- and that's a that's a real reductionist way of putting it. But just for the sake of expediency, I'm saying that's that's what it is. Let me give you guys a, a great example. Of what I'm talking about um, Levi and Judah, my oldest sons, who are now 21 and 18. Their first and only few. Their first and really only handful of experiences of being in a evangelical context um, was a funeral that um, a gentleman at our parish um, who was the son of um, an evangelical pastor had passed away. There's a son so of a preacher, was, man. Sorry. So there was this weird blended um, funeral thing. So we did like the Orthodox funeral for him. And then they did like a funeral service at his dad's church, whatever. So, I mean, what a case study. You have the Orthodox funeral, which is heavy. And in, in probably a lot of people watching this and a lot of people hearing this, whatever, have never been to an Orthodox funeral. So you don't know yet. And God bless you for not. But when you do, it's like, you know, two things will open your eyes, an Orthodox wedding and an Orthodox funeral. It's like, whoa, okay. So anyways, so they come from their first funeral, their first Orthodox funeral, And then they're going to this other, like, you know, celebration, homecoming, whatever they call it. And I'll never forget uh, Levi, my oldest, was just kind of like just tripping the whole time. And he had to have been, I don't even know what he was at this time, like five, maybe, maybe a little, yeah, maybe five, a little older. And no, maybe like six. And I think it was Judah, but one, like, they're like, they couldn't stand it. They're like, it's too loud in here. I got to get out of here. Mm. And then I take them out to get a break and everything. And I'm trying to explain to them. It's like, yeah, this is how people do church. And, you know, and he goes, this is church. Yeah. He's like, as innocent child, whatever. This is church. Now, someone would, some cynical person would be like, well, it's all he's ever seen is your context. And then of course he gets in something so radically different. He'd say that, but that doesn't mean it's not church, but I'd say, no, 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 Mm -hmm. trust me. You don't understand. Cause this kid was raised. Like these kids had been to the cornerstone festival. These kids were raised with me (laughs) and their mom. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I know people are scandalized, but like, you know, my kids know a Sabbath song or two. It it is what it is. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to say that, like, my kids weren't scandalized by, like, rock music. That wasn't it. I mean, mm-hmm. I played in bands most of their life, right? It wasn't rock music that scandalized them. It was this context. Of the just, context. Because yeah, they, this, they this know that, This doesn't feel like church. This feels like a rock. I know what, what a rock show is. Yeah. yeah. I know what a concert is, what and is. I know what church is. Exactly. This doesn't feel like church. This feels Separate like spaces. concert. spaces. That separate, separate spaces. spaces and the two mm-hmm. shall not meet. You know, and the two and shall it's not like, meet. Mm-hmm. I remember I had an Uber driver one time and he was like listening to Christian music or whatever, and I just zoned out. And he was like, Yeah, man, you go to church or anything? And I was like, Yeah. 
I'm a Eastern Orthodox. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, word, word. And I was like, okay. And then he's like, you should check out. Uh, there's a, there was, I don't know if there still is a Hillsong in Kansas City. Oh. And he was like, you should come check out Hillsong, man. He's like, oh. the music is great. And it, it hit me. I was like, that's the only thing you have to offer. Like the, is the well, music. and and what is and what is the great music lulling I can you go into? Listen because to, talk about corruption at its core. I talk can about listen a foundation to go that's listen broken. to like Mumford and Sons or Lumineers or whatever they're trying to emulate, like on my own time without having to go like hang out with a bunch of like cripsters and like just uh then like hang out and eat donuts and try and make like small talk with people. I'm like I'll just do that at home. Like this is what. If this is the big draw to your church like it's really like i was like oh well you know we've got like christ you know like that's that's the big draw of the orthodox it's just like no i mean and that's also what i tell people a lot is like go to that nave go to that room in our church and tell me it's not holy and then try and go to another church after that like it's just two completely different things it's just one is holy one is sacred one is like there to serve a very specific function and it's not emotionally manipulative in fact it's like the opposite it's like helping to get rid of like some of the world's emotional manip- whatever i, I could keep well going, th- this but- is, it's bringing this is bringing to mind an interesting experience that i had as a very young man my first my freshman year of college my my roommate in the dorms like and it was interesting this dude so so for people who don't know i went to i went to howard university right so historically black colleges so my roommate walks in first day. I remember he walked in. He's like six foot eight. I remember he had a size 18 shoe like this dude is like, yoked up. Right. Walks in and I'm like, oh, he, he must be on the basketball <laughs> team, something like Bobby. that. And, <laughs> oh, my and gosh. This, and this dude and this dude's like comes in and all of a sudden his he's all meek. He's like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'm Herman. But he was from I forget where he's just from somewhere in the south. And I, I immediately asked him, oh, you play you play ball like what do you and no, he was he was a, a musician. Right. And he was a very good musician, like gospel. So he was in like the gospel band at, at the school, the, in the gospel church. And I remember one time and like so very like Christian guy. And he was always talking, you know, he was always trying to do things in a Christian way. And he was, oh, that's not Christian. That's this and that like, but in a very sort of black church evangelical way and i remember sitting and having one day we're just sitting in in our dorm room and i'm just like grilling him a little bit about like theology right because at that time i'm i'm into weird occult stuff and all this and what was interesting was after a while it got to the point where i realized like oh this dude doesn't even know anything about the like there he knows no theology and at one point he just admitted he's like look man i'll just admit it like the reason I'm involved in the church is because I love to play music mm. and like I and I get to play music all the time. And that's and and for me, that's what it's about. Like that's the, at the end of the day, that's what it is. And I just remember being struck. You know, like. Because you could play music anywhere, but I guess that wouldn't have been acceptable to like his parents and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And it just I, I just got to thinking like that. that and, and this is bringing up for me that feeling that I had at that time where I was like. Something's wrong. Like I wasn't christian i mean i got you know i i had i had been raised a little bit in the church and everything but it something felt more wrong about him saying that in that moment like more almost more disrespectful to christ than me just being like i don't believe it yeah you know what i mean i'm an atheist i'm out of it yeah yeah i mean that it it was like oh you're almost you're faking you're in there you're faking the funk when really what you want to do is you just want to play your bass and and it's crazy because I think it isn't it isn't one for one, but I'll I'll take this scripture to kind of give a little bit of um, highlight or accent to it, which is you know, be hot or cold. Yeah. And and I think I think when we talk about lukewarm, I think sometimes we can maybe mistakenly see that as just being like indifferent. I think there's an aspect of that that is lukewarmness. But when I think of lukewarm, that's what I think of. You know what I mean? I think of someone who's just like doing the religious two-step, checking the boxes, doing what they need to do to get along. To me, that's lukewarmness. You know what I mean? Um, Where it's just like, I'm staying in this lane 
because it's just way more comfortable. I'm complacent here. Sure. You know what I mean? And it's just like, if this context was to Which change, is what we wanted to talk about today. <laughs> yeah. Right. If this if, if this context was, was to change, then I would change with it. That's that lukewarmness that, that the Lord talks about spewing from his mouth because the person who's, you know, honest about where they're at, I mean, this is Father Sarah from Rose when he talks about I would reject the God that atheists reject too. You know sure. what I mean? It's like there's there's something that can be done with honesty, right? And I've talked about this before. Like that's one of my big things, you know, um, trying to prepare my spiritual children to just face God honestly. Don't make excuses. Just own it. Just own it. Because if you can just own it, I don't mean like an un and like a, you know, puff out your chest at God. That's not what I mean. I mean just like, yeah, Lord, I did that. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah. no. She didn't make me do it, Lord. Uh, it wasn't because of this, Lord. It wasn't because of, you know, the oppression of this or that. This is this. I did this. If we, if you can do that, then, you know, you have a good chance of not suffering as much loss, right? Because that type of honesty, right? Like I said, honesty is the on-ramp to humility, right? By just being honest about those things before the Lord, not lying to yourself, not lying to him. Because look, no lies convince the court. It's it's not like it's not like your your lies are going to convince him anyway. So just just own it, you know. Yeah. Don't. And I think that's so hard for people because you know we we struggle with the the tepid water. We like just being that comfortable. Like, hey, I'm good. I'm good. You know what I mean? Like, no, 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 I'm good. But it it is such a dangerous place to be. You know. Are I, you saying? This that, that if this context, man, it's an interesting. That's an interesting thing you said, Father. Like I, I, I I'm, I'm stuck on it, and so now I want to dig into it. Like being in a situation where you say, if this context were to change, I would change with it. Mm -hmm. Right. This seems like to me the like this. This is sort of the 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 prerequisite. It seems like the prerequisite for anything bad to happen, right? And certainly what happened over the last three years, it seemed like that was the whole thing. Like, change the context a little bit, I'll change with it. Change the context a little bit, I'll change with it. Because what it's, it's weird, like, what am I attached to? What am I attached to? I'm attached to it's, And it's, it's, almost, it's almost hard for me to articulate this, but it's, it's going back into that situation of Herman, right? To where... Hey, I'm getting to play the music here, and I don't. I, I'm not attached to the theology. So if I come in tomorrow and the preacher starts saying something that maybe feels to me a little heretical, but I'm still able to play the bass, mm -hmm. then I'll probably like ignore it mm -hmm. to be able because like what would be the cost of me calling it out? Oh, maybe I don't get to play the bass anymore, mm -hmm. and then the context like changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then the next time he comes in and then like, you know, oh, the preacher's doing something else weird or the women are scantily clad. Mm -hmm. Right. Or something different. And it's like, oh, but am I still able to play the bass? Like, OK, yeah, I'm still able to able to play the bass. Hmm. So, OK, I'll stick around. And it just it feels like to me like that's the pattern of getting it, getting attached to this thing that like, oh, I'm a part of it, but I'm not really I'm not a part of it for the. Like I'm not, I'm not in this for Christ, mm -hmm. basically. Right, right, right. I'm in, I'm in this for, I guess, fundamentally, I'm in this for myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think this is interesting to me because, um, on the one hand, and I don't know if this is the right. I mean, I don't know if this is the proper form for this, but I'm almost kind of processing something real time right now. Because I'm just, I feel there's a reality in regards of what I'm about to say it just sounds like, okay, and in the sense that it's probably, it's like one message I just have, just that I talk about as a priest, just it gets repackaged. But it's just, it's something I've always seen. I see it all the time still. Um, 
but it's this reality of being able to be comfortable in and and to and to have a false sense of security in in the context of the church in the context of religious life and it and it what it one of the fruits of it is someone not living a life of repentance and therefore well it's someone not living a life of repentance and therefore the fruits of it is they they don't even recognize the need to repent do you, do you see what i'm saying and that's so dangerous it's so dangerous because so, wait i'm sorry father forgive me forgive me so are you saying that they're that their reason for participation in the church is not repentance is that what it is that it's like correct correct okay cuz i okay. cuz again repent like repentance isn't some sort of very static um two dimensional thing that you can define you know it and you're done you moved on you know what i'm saying i think people look at repentance kind of like have you ever had poke you know or like oh you ever had sushi yeah i had that okay i'm good you know what i mean or it's like you know oh did you see winter soldier or did you see the whatever you know the last black panther like whatever Whatever movie is, oh, I okay, yeah, I did that. Okay, check. You know what I'm saying? P like, people see this as like a one, like, okay, I did that. I did the thing. I'm good. I'm initiated. I'm good. And that is that is not the way to see this, right? Because it isn't just about like, yeah, before I before I came to orthodoxy, we'll just keep. Let's just even make it even simple. Let's narrow it down to orthodoxy, right? For game orthodoxy, you know, I uh, I was an atheist and um, I had a real nasty porn habit. Okay, but now I'm good. I'm on the right side and blah blah blah. You know, I confess because I ate too much and I still dabble a little bit, but it's all good. Okay. Well, I mean that's great. It's better that than you staying an atheist and still you know not caring about your porn habit, but. The thing that I'm trying to say is like, man, you're still eating the slop, really. Like, you're still the prodigal who's like, I mean, I'm eating slop, but at least I'm eating. You know, you're not quite yet at that place where you come to yourself, as it says in the scripture, and then you realize, what am I doing? You know what I mean? What am I doing? The servants eat better in my father's house, right? Because once you get that, like, repentance isn't the one-off thing of, like, yeah, I no longer, you know, do this terrible thing that I used to do and I go to church. But rather, like, oh, how do I, how do I actually get this life that Christ is talking about? Oh, 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 what if the stuff I'm reading in the books and all this stuff is actually real. Like, like not even just like, yeah, but I believe it's real because I say the creed and like, and I'm I'm not woke and all that stuff. But like, really like, oh, this is real? Oh, I actually need to watch my thoughts? Oh, I can't just kind of show up at church and be like, okay, and like, not do those bad things. But like, I actually have to look what's going on inside my, I have to bring my thoughts captive to Christ. Oh, I have to bring every thought that like captive like that's not hyperbole like I, or I have to struggle for this that is where repentance starts to become regenerative see the thing is is people aren't in the regenerative life they're they're in that place where it's like okay I'm religious I'm good I'm not actively like sinning I guess but that's only part of it there's this whole other side where you become all aflame you start becoming something different Right, and it, it you start you start getting little tastes of the grace of God, and once you begin, once you get that, then you're like, man, you know what it's like. We had this uh, ballet recital for the parish, the parish school, oh, you know, as a ballet class, whatever. And so, <sighs> Morwenna, this is cute little Morwenna, she's this little Irish doll. You know what I mean? And it was just kind of like she was doing cartwheels the whole time. Like at the most like 
inappropriate time, just like doing a cartwheel, right? And I loved it because here's why I loved it. I loved watching do that because I, I made a joke to someone was like, oh, that's something you realize you have. You're like, oh, I can do what video games do. And you just want to do it all the time. You know, it's this kind of awareness of like, oh, I can do this thing, right? So she's so stoked that she can bang out a really good cartwheel. And she's doing it all the time, yeah. right? I get that. You know what I mean? I get that. I get like that moment of, you know, when my mind isn't in hell, I'm like, oh man, it'd be so great to be pain free. You know, like all these different things that you think about, you're like, oh, it'd be so great to be able to do whatever. It's like, um, I, it, man, the, the person who learns how to paint is like, oh, I can actually paint without thinking about it. Or the person who can actually play a song all the way through and like, or improvise, like, Whatever the thing is, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I, I baked my first cake and it didn't fail. Like, you know what I'm saying? You you get a taste of like, oh, I can do something that's beyond me, right? Mm. I can do something that was beyond me and now I can do it. That is just a, that's just a, 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 just a fragment of what I'm talking about in regards of when you get the grace of God, the regenerative grace that comes from repentance. You're like, man, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, it's and that's what people miss out on when they're complacent. You know it's, what I'm saying? It's interesting because we know someone who's about to make a very big move because she had a radical experience at a monastery. And she's like, once you feel that home, you would do anything to get that back. You yeah. would do anything to get that back. But I, I actually had a question, Father. You said a little while ago um, that okay, so a person has stopped their porn habit. They still do a little bit, you know, whatever, 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 but they're still, and then you said, okay, that's great. It's better that you're doing that. But I actually wonder, isn't it kind of like, wouldn't it be better if they had stayed like an atheist and like indulged their porn habit rather than like coming in and confessing and still dabbling a little bit, kind of being complacent and or becoming hot because here yeah, in yeah, this... yeah. I see I see what you're saying and oh. and and it's both and okay it's okay both and. It, it depends on the person because like yeah because that person what you're talking about they're basically slid into the jacuzzi and they're just kind of acclimating so that is that's bad right but at the same token I I don't want to completely because it's really easy for people to get the wrong impression sure like if you're going from negative nine to a negative six, that's great. I'm all for it. You sure. know what I mean? So that's what I mean in that. But context. it's still, you're still in the negative. You're still in the negative. negative. You're still in the negative. Don't get you're it moving, twisted. But you're moving. Don't get it twisted. So the problem is when you start coming off, like you're not a negative still. Like, I'm glad you're negative six instead of negative nine. That's great. But like, don't get it twisted. And don't, don't start acting like you aren't still a negative. You are. Yeah. That, that's the difference, right? So, and I think that's the thing is when the person stops and they go like, yeah, at least I'm not doing whatever. And people think that. Yeah. At least I'm not, at least I'm not as bad as I used to be. Correct. And it's like, yo, but it's still bad. It's still like bad. you're still, it's still, and yes, you're not because you were horrible, but right. you're still bad. You, you, touched, I mean? you touched on this on catechism father is if you're confessing the sin you're really just confessing a symptom of a much larger problem. And as long as that much larger problem goes unaddressed, you're still in the sickness. So like um, I was talking with someone and they're talking about the, the, like the chain of whys. And it's like, why am I doing this? Okay. Be well, okay. Why am I, why do I care? What people think of me? Well, because I want people to like me. Well, why do you want people to like me? Well, I want people to like me because I don't want to lose my friends. Well, why do you not want to lose? Well, I don't want to end up alone. Well, why don't you want to, you know, da, 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 all the mm -hmm. way down. And it's like, if you stay on that first two couple whys, okay, why am I looking at porn? You know, oh, because it makes me feel good. Okay. Well, why does it so important for you to feel good? Well, because I felt bad at one time and I want to feel better. And then if you just stay there, mm -hmm. you're, you still have this whole chain that's going down and you're not, and you're not getting to there into like, you know, like father, it's like mowing a weed instead of like pulling it up. You know, mm -hmm. I think you've talked about that before in catechism before too. Well, mm -hmm. there's some, there's something about, there's something that's kicking off to me here about praxis, right? And about, because I'm, I'm getting what you're saying, 
Father, about what you said at first about how repentance is kind of this like, it's almost like an event that happened. Like someone could could view it as like, this is the wrong way of viewing it, right? Mm -hmm. Like as like an event that happened. Oh yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing, you know, the difference between that and and praxis. And like, I can see it in various different contexts in my life. So like bodybuilding, playing volleyball, writing the books that I've written, um, software development when I'm working on a, you know, a big software project. And there's this sort of thing about Praxis where like I could be like, oh, yeah, you know, I write some code, but that's a real there's something very different about, oh, I'm building this, you know, this big thing that that requires me to do this work that is like nonstop. It's ongoing. But also, it's not just when I'm sitting down to do the code. Like right now, I'm thinking about like when I was playing volleyball competitively. That it was like, yeah, I had to go and train and do volleyball, sure. Um, and then I had to like play tournaments on the weekend and all of that. Mm-hmm. But also, I had organized my life in such a way, like I was training in the gym in a specific way so that I would have the capability to do certain things on the volleyball court. I was eating in a certain way. I was sleeping at a certain time. I was consuming certain content. I was hanging out with certain people. Like my praxis of this thing that I was oriented to changed. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, I've played beach volleyball before or, oh yeah, I go every once in a while and play on the weekends. It was like, no, this is what I'm like living a life of volleyball. And the people that I was around would be like, volleyball is life. And I see the same thing with the idea of when you say living a life of repentance, that it's like, no, what I'm going to choose to eat for lunch Mm -hmm. is going to be influenced by the fact that I am living a life of repentance. Whether or not I am going to spend another minute in conversation with this particular person about this particular topic is going to be determined by whether or not I am living a life of repentance. You See, know what I mean? It's totally it's different. Ca- it's kind of crazy to me because I'm so tempted to make a blanket statement right now. And, you know, I mean, I'm a polemicist. You know what I mean? I, I speak in polemics. Like, it's just, What's you know. What's polemics, and, Father? Sorry. Well, I'll speak polemically, meaning that I will use kind of like generalized, somewhat sweeping statements and arguments to get a point across. But I, I do it knowingly missing some, some measure of nuance because I, I, because of the forum, because of like the context at times, you know what I mean? To like throw something out and then kind of like deconstruct it later, right? So I'm going to make this kind of statement and I know that it's really generalized, and it's what it's like uh, talking about, you know, the uh, when we were talking about generations, you know, millennials. It's like, listen, guys, if you didn't know, I, I get it. It's like we're all guilty. You know what I mean? We're all guilty. But for the sake of that conversation, I was like, okay, boom, and I pulled something apart, an observation. But ultimately, I'm guilty because it's like, how many times have I talked about like the spiritual, the Russian spirituality that's ex- like exemplified through Dostoevsky? It's like taking on repentance for like your people and for a generation. So it's like for a nation, you know, even though you're not technically guilty of it, you are still responsible and you bear a connection. Right. So I'm just throwing that out there. Cause you know, it's all good. It's all fine, whatever. But like I was speaking polemically about like generation stuff when it's like, clearly I'm guilty of everything that the millennials can be guilty of too. You see what I'm saying? But speaking polemically about it, it's like, wow, millennials are the worst, you know, which they are. But anyways, so they are, they are, they are. So they point are. being, uh, I'm going to say this and it's, it, it's a really sweeping thing. So this is another thing I want to say. I'm digressing, forgive me, but I do know this happens because I've seen it in, um, when we had the conversation about baptism and I saw it where someone's like, man, blah, 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 blah. And then someone, God bless you. I can't remember all the players, but God bless you. Like actually father cleared this up on this point right here and they timestamp it so so god bless you like yes i speak in these sweeping things but if you just wait a couple more seconds i'll try to clear it up you know what i mean that being said let me make a sweeping statement okay i have found a big divide is that people who not always i i'm I'm even thinking of the exceptions in my mind but people who tended to be more 
scrupulous about their praxis tended to not tended to be more skeptical about the things that happened in 20. People who tended to be more kind of like on the kind of mythio poetic and like everything's just analogy and like ideological and all of that, they tended to be more caught up with the narrative, okay. the world narrative, right? Okay. People like another example, people who tended to see kind of like poor people in general, you know what I mean? Tend to be like, oh, like the church needs reform and social justice. Like people, forgive me, it's a sweeping generalization, right? But people who tend to read public orthodoxy and like all those terrible like things, they tend to be like, yeah, social justice and like all this stuff, but they don't, they hate poor, they hate individuals you know I mean they don't actually they they love the idea of poor people but don't but don't actually commune with any actual poor persons you see what i'm saying so i know there's exceptions bring it on that's great but what i'm trying to say is like this praxis thing's important because for people it's like anything else if i'm if i am eating breathing sleeping volleyball i care about it so when someone comes in, they're like, hey, we're going to start doing Maui rules instead of like whatever rules. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, hey. No, 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 no. Oh, exactly. No, 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 no. We've always done it. You know what I mean? What, what are you trying to pull? Right. Oh, so, father, even somebody tries to come and play on a court in the afternoon. And it's like, no, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Even somebody on this or this court over here will be like, oh, 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 oh. 15 minutes from now, a group of women who have played there for 20 years are about to show up. I'm sorry, you can't play on that court. Like, it's not going to work. Can't do it. It's a public court. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, like, when things... That's, I mean, and again, the complacency, right? Because when things got weird, when things got weird, it was like, what's going on here? Like, that's, you know what I mean? Because when you're so grounded and rooted in something, you know it, it's your life, like you do it, you're kind of like the slightest shift in it. It's like the spider in the web, man. The slide is like, ooh, what is that? What? Praxis, praxis is your bar- is, is your barometer. It's, it's your crazy. Barometer. It's crazy that you're saying this, Father, because I think it's it's and and of course Christian praxis would be the biggest of uh, like Orthodox praxis praxis would be the biggest of barometers, but it's weird that I, because I've even told people this about 2020. It's like, when did my spidey sense go off? When they closed the gym. Yeah. When they closed all the gyms. Because every morning at 5 a.m. for decades in mm-hmm. many different cities, what did I do? I woke up and I went to the gym. Mm-hmm. Like, that was my praxis. And in all those decades, had the gyms ever been closed? No. So what's going on? All kinds of things had happened. All kinds of things had been done, but they closed the gyms. And I think that this is like, I had never thought about that until you said it, but it's like that value, that value of praxis. How else? Of course, that's what exactly what you were talking about, about like, if the context changes, I will change with it. And it's like, no, this is outside of the context because me getting up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym, it didn't matter whether I was in Las Vegas or New Hampshire or in London or in did, it didn't matter. Panama at 5 a.m. I'm getting up and I'm going to the gym and the gym was always open. Yep. Yep. So and it's it's super important because, I mean, I'll, I, I've told the story a million times, but I'm just going to bring up this one little point because it, it's it's important. Right. I've been on record. Everyone should thank Papadia because she was the one that was really like, hey, 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 right? But, but what's pertinent to the story is the, the, that initial crack, though, for me, right, to get me, like, to really hear what she was saying and to work to my own Bangalore and my own, like, I don't want to, like, break out of, like, you know, I don't want to upset people or so that because that was my struggle. I'm just, you know, I'm repenting and, like, confessing it. But I'll never forget, it was like the, the initial rumblings and then a certain somebody brought up like, well, you know, this certain priest over here, you know, he's, he's you know, they're, they're, they're dipping spoons, they're getting alcohol, you know, maybe we should do that. And I was like, what? And it was just, it was, it was such a just, it was a gut reaction. There was no like, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not going to front and be like, oh, I had this whole like breakdown. Or, like, it was just an initial gut, just like, 
No. Vis- visceral. No, it was in- visceral. Incarnational. And and that's I, I go to that point for me, that's where I go like, well, that's definitely like where I saw the if I'm looking back now and everything, that's where mm-hmm. the break with me and certain people happened. Because I remember even that person's response was like, why did I have such a visceral reaction? And like, oh, that was weird. But it was because it was like that was a web, and it's like, no, something's it was just the spidey sense, something is and it and it it comes from that connection right Mm -hmm. that it comes from that connection and that's why what i have seen even before even before the madness of 20 the people generally because there's a lot of people who fell away like we came in like this group like the the group of people that came in with me and, and subsequently after from our little subculture click tons of people fell out and you know i mean it's a generalization sure we can talk about the exceptions generally speaking those people they they didn't have praxis they didn't want it they didn't know it they didn't care about it it was just kind of like whatever the people it's a generalization we can find i'm sure people who had praxis and they fell away sure and we can find people by god's mercy didn't and they're what i don't know it's up to god so i'm not trying to say it's like works that save them but i do find a strong connection a strong i find a strong connection between people who there was a measure of like, I got to do this. Orthodoxy woke them up to their lack. That's what I have found somewhat mm-hmm. a consistent thread. The person who wakes up to their lack and realizes I'm lacking. I was talking about this earlier. The scales are in the balance and I'm found lacking. Yeah. Right. Those are the people who, when they have that moment, they wake up and it's just like, boom. They're off to the races. The other people who don't really find themselves lacking, and these are the people who tend, typically speaking, forgive me, again, generalization, okay? But typically speaking, I came to orthodoxy because of intellectual, purely intellectual pursuits, purely like whatever. Ah, they're very susceptible to this, right? Because it because they're approaching it where it's just like, well, this this satisfies and titillates my intellect. Right. Well, those of us who who are found weighing in the balance and found lacking, we're like, oh, my gosh. Right. And it becomes a matter of life and death it becomes a matter of like, oh, I got to do this. That does become. And, and this is this is a very patristic idea of it's how you develop discernment. Yeah. You don't develop discernment in an abstract vacuum. It can not develop discernment by by praxis. Right. I mean, I mean, it's not that crazy, you know, but it's I was just talking with the catechumen yesterday and he was talking about um, I can't remember how the topic came up, but we were talking about the death penalty and we talked about that episode that we talked about it. And I was like, that's kind of one of the problems with. Well, no, it's not the problems. It's one of the wonderful things about orthodoxy is we are talking about a person following a person rather than a abstract ideal of or like a philosophy that really like the nuances that life brings you can't be fully addressed because no person sitting down and thinking of this philosophy can really account for every situation that could possibly come and certainly no philosopher a great thinker outside of, again speaking generally probably saw 2020 coming and the attacks that it brought on certain institutions, certain foundations and the flipping and radicalization of people, blah, blah, blah. And I was talking about, there's so much nuance that you can find one father saying something and then another father saying what would seem to be the complete opposite. It's like, but it's no, it's not contradictory. And then he brought up this really excellent example of, holding up two pieces of paper one here and one here and going like this and it looks like they're getting ready to hit each other but they're not it looks like they're not you know the same thing that's great that's a great example and i was like that's exactly what that is it looks like they're different it looks like they're about to hit but they're not they're actually two separate things well it's harmony it's the principle of harmony right it's two notes that appear to be different until you put them together and you realize that they're part of a chord I, and in, it's a single chord, right? Back to music. That's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, um, 
Yeah, I think. And it's by the way, the chord is more powerful than each than either of the single notes by themselves, by far and away, in terms of what it's expressing and in terms of 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 its use. Right. That's right. Yeah, I can't. Right. There's some some mute that you line from the band mute that you're is like, what what's uh. I can't remember. He's like, why play guitar with one string or something like that? Like, why would you do that? Like, I, I can't mean, remember. But... Unless you're like that one guy who had that one great song, like Chicken Popcorn, like whatever. He was the guy that was on NPR. He, he told... Anyways. Yeah. Uh, no, but I think Max me... Cavallaro actually takes the two bottom strings off of his guitar because he only needs like the top four. He's like, yeah, I, all I, think, I do is play rhythm. So. The, I was going to say the thing about Praxis too is like, you actually become, and I think this is another thing people miss out on, is that endeavoring in your praxis is one of the ways that you move from being an individual note into a chord. Yeah. And that's something that people miss out on us too. It's like, it isn't just about like, oh, this is my prayer rule. It's like, yeah, it's your prayer rule, whatever, but like your prayer rule is the prayer of the church. That's just to keep you linked in. That keeps you linked in and keeps you, makes you, helps you to actually it, it, it hones you so that you can be so that you can fit in that so that you can be a note that fits in the chord or you know what i'm saying it, yeah. it hones you so that you can fit into the the broader mosaic it's but, tuning but, it's tuning you it's properly yeah. tuning you yeah. there's a saint and i forgive me i can't remember who it was but he was talking about i can't be with god and man at the same time sorry, only sorry, because sorry. what's that sorry father arsenius the great he, because he's talking about in heaven, they are all part of one will. Mm-hmm. And then and in humanity, there's all these different wills. And like learning to tune my will, because that's the thing. And I'll say this as a person, and I don't mean to pull that card because I don't pull it very often. But I'm a person who works with the homeless population day in and day out. They are pretty awful to be around. Not all of the time. Most of the time they come in and especially as of late, I don't know if this has been going on for a long time or if this is a post whatever, feel sorry for yourself, cultural thing. But everybody's got a story about how none of this is their fault. Everybody has screwed them over. Nobody wants to help them. And they come in and really it's just a gripe session for the first 15 minutes and them naming every single thing that going back to second grade that everyone's ever done wrong to them. And it's like, okay, the reason why I'm able to sit with this person right now is because to the tiny extent that I have done it, my will is it is my job to sit here. And after reading so many, the the, the amount of lives of saints that I have where they just received people, doesn't matter if the person was a good person or not. I understand saints received people and sat and talked with them. So that's like, that's the one little string I'm holding on to before I'm just like, tell this dude to get the heck out of my office. I cannot sit here and listen to him like ramble anymore. I'm trying to give him resources. I'm trying to help him. And he's just going on and on and on about all. And he really just wants someone to listen to him complain. That's really, or she just wants someone to listen to him complain and, and commiserate with them and tell them, oh, it's not your fault. Oh, I can't believe this is happening. Just take care of all their problems. And the one thing I'm holding on to is that St. Rachel sat and listened to person after person after person after person all day, every day. And she was a hundred times more sick than I was, didn't have any teeth, just one eye, just sitting on a couch, just like in low key intense pain all the time so i can sit here and listen to this person talk and like to that what to that level my will has been slightly subjected to something much bigger than myself and it's through praxis because i've tried it without praxis and i end up getting mad i end up being like well screw this get out of my office and then i watch youtube for the next hour because i feel awful about myself because i kicked this person out and um I need to do something to like pacify myself. So I watch stupid stuff on YouTube. It's like, well, that's not what I want to do. So how do I not do that? And that's like maintain just a little bit of praxis that you have, just a little bit that you have. It's like that, you know, you just open up that valve a little bit and the water comes spraying out because it is, it's, it's really just this like moment of like 
it really has to be like, it doesn't really matter what I want in this moment. I can't get there without Praxis. And it's a little mini dose of repentance. Every time you engage, because really it's like prayer. Here's a couple of things. If you can learn to pray when you don't want to pray, you're on your way to becoming Orthodox, right? Because Orthodox pray when they don't want to pray. Oh, that's, that's huge. That's huge. That's like huge. that. Yeah, like, big, 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 big. Like, I think if I can like, okay, good night, everybody. You know what I mean? Like those of you out there, it's like, if you actually learn to pray when you don't want to pray, you're becoming Orthodox, right? If you can... Well, it, Father, isn't... I, forgive me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that really is the definition of praxis. Mm -hmm. Like, it isn't actually praxis if you only do it when you want to. Mm -hmm. Like, praxis is the thing that you do no matter what. Mm -hmm. Like, that you that that it's like, oh, I really don't want to be doing this right now. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's St. Joseph the Hesychist. I mean, he's right there. I mean, that's his whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he's right there. Yeah. Right, yeah. There he is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so on top of that, when you begin to understand that that repentance, that little shot of repentance of just subjugating your will to the greater truth, that is joining your will to the will of Christ, like joining your will with the will of, of brothers and sisters throughout time, because that's what we all share is this little crucifixion, right? Because I wasn't able to, you know, say no to myself and I yelled at my kid. Okay. But I'm going to say my prayers, even though I don't want to. You know what I mean? It's like there's a little bit of that crucifixion that you can enter into, which is regenerative. Because that moment that you say prayers, even though you don't want to, if you have this mindset, of, I'm saying no to myself, I'm entering the, into this death. Well, guess what? There's going to be a resurrection. Every time you choose to die for the sake of Christ, every time you choose to die for the sake of the love of Christ and his church, there's going to be a resurrection, right? Now, let's just be clear. When you're dying for the sake of the love of Christ, I'm not just saying when you're dying because of your ego or you're dying because of, you know, your own personal desires. That's not right. When you're dying for the sake of Christ, there will be a little resurrection. So, you know, came home, hard day, whatever. I just want to go and, like, veg out for a couple minutes. But I haven't seen the kids in, like, two days because I've been working so crazy, right? <sighs> okay. I don't want to, but let me actually get on the floor and play with the kids. Let me, like, in, right? That... That, you know, hour and a half of dying to yourself for the love of God, for the love of your family, for the love of Christ, right? Let me actually do this thing. Even if it's just like, man, 10 minutes, that 10 minutes, if you don't waste it on YouTube, will be resurrectional, right? You, it'll be it's resurrection. Everything. That's, that's, that's the, I mean, in, like the thing in bodybuilding is it's like, no, it's the, it's the last set, uh, not even the last, set, it, the, the last set, yes, but it's the last rep, right? It's the last one where it's like your entire body is screaming mm -hmm. and it's like, no more, no more, no more, no more. It's that one, that mm -hmm. one that you do is when people who are like, oh, my body's not changing. I've been in the gym for two years. It's like, I've seen it so many times where it's like, if I've been, if I've been able to just get with them and be like, Okay, well, I see what the problem is. Like you just you just rack that weight. Okay, no, one more. I can't do one more. And it's like, no, you're gonna do this one more. I'm gonna give you a little, I'm not gonna let it fall on you. I'm gonna give you a little bit of help. They do that for like three weeks and they blow up like this. Mm -hmm. And they're huge and they're ripped in three weeks. And they're like, I couldn't do this in three years. And it's like, yeah, it's that one, mm -hmm. it's the that 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 10 seconds forgive that me 10 seconds that forgive you didn't me. want to do it forgive that's me. everything big sweeping thing whatever but like you know I'll, I'll hold hold me to it it's the same thing in the spiritual life yeah it, i mean it really 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 is right because i i know i i got the gambit you know i know people who man 
they got grace. I know people, they don't got grace. You know what I mean? And what's the thing? It's like not, it's not like, oh man, well, this person is so much, they were born smarter. They were born holier. No, 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 no. They put the work in. I And, and again, I because this is tough. I know it's going to send the wrong message to someone because listen, God sends his, like God's grace is a gift. Like you can't earn it. Like, listen, this is, this is the thing about grace. God sends grace when he wants it. And you'll get grace when you least expect it, right? Sometimes you get grace when, you just, like, you, when you've fallen and you're just like, ah, oh, you're on the edge of despair. It's like, boom, God hits you. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much God loves me, right? So let's just be really clear. I'm not saying like, oh, if you, if you do 5,000 Jesus prayers in one day, you're going to be, lo- that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. But at the same token, what I am saying, though, is if you hold to what's been given to you in obedience, regardless of how you feel, you are very much more likely to receive grace. And on top of that, the grace in which you see, receive is, is really commiserate to what you are able to receive. See, that's, that's the other thing that people don't understand. It's like, if, here's another thing, okay? Want to be orthodox? Pray when you don't feel like praying. Here's another thing. Your prayer and your asceticism is not about making you necessarily holier or even a better person. It's about making you able to hold grace when it comes to you. It's cleaning so think the cup, of, yeah? Think of it like, okay, you're, you're a cup that's going to... Are you like one of those really weird shallow cups that are just, you know, decorative? It's like, not, no one's going to drink out of that. That's just decorative. That's to make me feel like I'm in a medieval, like, goblet. Like... <laughs> but you're not even that this, you know what I mean? That's just like a splash of whatever. Or are you actually something that's like deep and can hold a solid drink? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Think of your praxis, your asceticism, your prayer, your disciplines. That's that's the point, right? It's like it's another thing too. I, I know this drives people crazy, but it's like reading scripture is on the one hand, like eating a burger. We've talked about this before, right? I just see a juicy burger. I don't think about vitamin E, protein, B, zinc. I don't think about that. I just see a juicy burger and or lovely falafel, right? So fast. Yeah. Uh, I, I think of falafel <laughs> and it goes into my body and my body takes the nutrients. Okay, sure. That's what happens when you read scripture. When you pray, you don't always understand. That definitely happens. But there's a whole other thing that also happens, which is this. You are priming the pump, if you will. Because can the Holy Spirit come and download and give you scripture that you have no idea? Absolutely can. That's what happened to St. Mary of Egypt. But here's the other thing. You're not asceticizing like St. Mary of Egypt was. You know what I'm saying? So it kind of proves my point because her gnarly asceticism allowed her to have like a download without ever reading it. Okay, you may not be able to set aside and hurt like her, but when you do read the scriptures, when you do read the prayers of the church, when you when you do put the time in, you're priming the pump, and you're you're shall we say, um, you are downloading information so much so that when it's time to access it, it's a lot easier for it to be accessed. It's the spirit nice. can give you a prompt that is a lot easier to to access. It's almost like a, I don't know, like in in regards of coding. Um, it would be a shortcut or whatever, but like, it's like a shortcut. It's like, boom, it's a lot easier to get there to access that file. Now that that shortcut's been kind of, that pathway has been created. Yeah. It can be done without it, but the way, but that's a lot more difficult versus like, Hey, if you put the time in after a while, you're like, boom, where'd that scripture come from? Well, you, you've already, you've already downloaded it in there in this way back in the D drive, but it's there. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know no, I mean? it's, the way that I experience yeah. it is, is that it's usually a lot more painful. If I need to suddenly be, it's like that show. I can't, it's some, some Japanese show where they, there's this wall that's coming at you and you have to like move your body a certain way to like make it through the hole. It's like cut out a very certain way. So you have I to stay, like, I, I stay away from those. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So the way that, because like, if you're already seeing it because you're ready and you know you've been putting in the work then you can get to that but if like the 
I guess the Holy Spirit has to like move you and jerk you to like be in that position. Like it really hurts. Like speaking from personal experience, like something is coming in my life where I'm going to need grace. Like over the, Hard instead lesson. of, yeah. O- instead of over the course of six months, I developed some practice and some understanding like, Hey, don't just be whistling Dixie all the time. Like and nothing's no, no worries. Everything's fine. And some, suddenly something hits you and really needs to bring you down fast. Like that's really painful. Yeah. And it's a spiritual, like, it's a spiritual limberness. Forgive me. It's a spiritual limberness. No, it's like that, the idea of like, Oh, I'm, I, I might be, I work security at a club, so I might be getting into a fight at some point. So Let me make stretch. sure that I'm stretching every day sure. so that when I need to throw a kick at somebody or I need to throw a hard punch that I don't throw my shoulder out when I'm sure. about to do that, knowing that maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't happen, mm-hmm. but I know that this is the life I lead. So let me be sure that I'm stretching in the mornings and evenings, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, I think you need to be at a certain level and the stretching this, the limberness, the whatever. It's just like, I have found the main thing I want to emphasize in my own ex- is it's just really painful. It's like, and like, not, not like a, cause you know, I, I have to be okay with being uncomfortable and being in pain. That's fine. But like, I'm talking about like my cat dies, that mm-hmm. that's the spot I need to be at in order to kind of receive the things I'm about to receive. And like my cat would probably die regardless, but I would be a little bit more at peace with it. A little bit more like relying on God to help me through that, to get me through to the next thing, instead of like forcing and cramming my way into this certain position. And then um, father, something that you said made me think of a, I was having a conversation with a brother from the church yesterday. He was talking about, you know who Corey Ten Boone is? Yeah. Yeah, She hit Jews during the Holocaust. Long and short, she hit Jews during the Holocaust. Yeah. Well, she, uh, he encountered she, one of the um, like she survived something and then encountered one of the uh, Nazi jailers like years later. I don't know anything about this. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I think it's Corey Tim Boom, and she was at like some kind of like like dinner or something like that, and saw one of the Nazi like an ex Nazi there. And she talks about like freezing and like freezing up and like this whole. I'm pretty sure that's quite. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember having to read this and be like, "Oh, this is wild." And it was this wow. whole thing of like her needing to, like, exercise forgiveness, um, encountering this like Nazi guy who was like repenting or like something like wow. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well. Yeah. She's talking about he clacked that. I'm pretty sure that's Corey Tim Boone. She um she was either about to she saw what was coming or something like that. I can't remember exactly the details of the story, but that's not what's important. What's important is she's talking to her dad and she said, I don't know if I have the grace to be a martyr. And her dad said, If we were going on a train, when would I give you the train ticket? She's like, right before I got on the train. He's like, why? She's like, because if you gave it to me earlier, I might lose it. Lose it. And he's like, so that's exactly what we're talking about. Like that grace. And I think what made me think of it is you had to be in a place to receive it. Like, because Mm -hmm. like your transponder, I guess, has to be open. Your receiver has to be open in order for that thing to come. And back then it was probably easier because life was harder. It was more difficult. You kind of had to like... You know, there was no none a lot of the appliances and stuff like that that made life easier than it does now. So there was probably a little bit more struggle. So her receptor was naturally more open. Um, but like now with like the asceticism that we practice, it's like any kind of like prying open of that receiver, it's like that's that's like a huge because like what father is saying earlier, and I know I'm kind of all over the place, but what father was saying earlier with the cartwheels. That's so absolutely true. Cause like for the first time, it's like, okay, I instinctively handled a situation which would have used to have baffled me. Mm-hmm. Like as somebody came to mm. me and said, like, da 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 da, and I was able to be like, wait a minute, mm-hmm. let me quote mm-hmm. St. John yes. Chrysostom here. Mm-hmm. Like this, and like just like instinct, and it was like totally like hit me, and like totally like, wait a minute all three of my kids are screaming 
they're all melting down. What do I do? Oh, for the first time in my life, I just turn and face the icon corner. It's like, okay, there it is. Like if I had, and I have been in my life at points where that's not even an option. Like that's not Mm -hmm. an option. It's TV. Like we stick them in front Mm -hmm. of the TV or something, which we never really have done. But it's like that grace that responders open a little bit. So anyway, how how many times Andrew have like it's happened to me on this show many times. How many times has what it's, ha, have you been given something that you didn't know that you were going to need at that? It, it seemed just like random at that moment. And then like the next day, it's like, oh, funny All that time. funny that this should come up because just yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> there was I this, am, this I, I am, read this saint's life or I read this quote or I read this this scripture I verse or whatever quote unquote forced quote unquote to sit and pay attention to my spiritual father for two hours every week it's enormously beneficial it is like oh, enormously yes, like and I'm not even listening passively like listeners I have to engage. I have to Mm -hmm. be able to, because I have not engaged in the past and came across sounding very foolish because I didn't understand the topic of what we're actually talking about. I was on some other thing. I was like, so do you think that means this? And you guys are both like, "Uh, I don't (laughs) think we're really talking about that, but that's fine. And I'm like, you should probably pay a little bit more attention. And so now I have to sit and engage. And it's same with catechism. It's like usually something comes up. We were talking, and I don't remember what it was. We're talking about that sickness episode. And then the next three months were just sickness. It was like Mm -hmm. that literally the next three months of at one point in my house, someone was sick for the next three months. So like, and it was enormously beneficial for me to just remember little snippets of father quoting the fathers or, you know, some, some truth from Christ that like really helped like, no, this is salvific. This is not just a thing happening in a vacuum at random. Like, no, this is for my benefit. Like, this is enormously helpful. And then getting better by not focusing so much on myself. Like, that was enormously beneficial. You know, I want to throw something out there, too, because I think one of the things getting back to, like, the complacency aspect of it is you can begin to forget, like, oh, this is all real. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. when I need Christ, when I need the Holy Spirit, the father will send it like you can, you can begin to forget that, which is again, getting back to why praxis is important because it keeps you kind of in the game. Right. And just to be really frank, it's like that reality of remembering that this, it isn't just kind of like checking the box. Right. It's like, no, I need this. I need this. So I don't lose my cool with this guy. I need this. So, you know, it's kind of funny. I, you know, I, I have particular habits, like I have particular viewing habits. There's particular things that I view, right? And I don't probably spend too much time viewing it, I'm sure, but like I like viewing things that are uncomfortable. You know, I'm just, I'm going to expose myself. So this might be like the thing that sinks the ship. I don't know. <laughs> I like. <laughs> I like you're gonna say pimple popping videos. Yes. Oh I like God. I like watching oh, Dr. Dr. Pimple Popper. I yeah, I like it. watching I pimple popping stuff. I like watching um like surgeries and like when people have been like like wounded, you know, um crippled. Um sometimes So you don't flinch. So you don't flinch. Yeah, I, I and like I don't like the soft underbill, I, I have to give mm-hmm. that a kind of uh, qualification, the super salacious, like weird stuff that they get. I don't like watching that, but like the stories of like, you know, I just have this very tragic life, like life, whatever. I like mm-hmm. watching that stuff. I like watching, I was like watching stuff from just like, okay, like, <clears throat> oh, this just happened in a gas station. You know, this person was randomly just, you know, attacked. I like watching that stuff because it it keeps me I I've conditioned myself. I'm just whatever. I'm just sharing with you guys, right? This is mm-hmm. this is my Bruce Wayne moment. Whatever. Mm-hmm. I I condition myself to not watch things that like lull me to sleep. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not. You know, it is what it is. Like, don't get me wrong. 
every once in a while I watch a Kate Bush video. Oh, that's great. You know what I mean? But I like if I'm if I'm going to go down that rabbit hole or something, I like to watch something that doesn't lull me to sleep. I like watching stuff that makes me uncomfortable. It's good for me. For someone else, that may be too much, but for me, it's good because it's very easy for us. I realize this, right? It is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like our community is super intense. I understand it. I get it. It is what it is. But like what people don't forget, you know, art, it is what it is. We're in the middle of the hood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the reason why the benefits of our, of our community is because of that. Because I've been in communities where it's just, it's the easiest thing to just kind of like, yeah, like this is kind of like what we do and whatever, you know? And there's something about forcing yourself to look at the, the, the grit and the horror of this life. I, I just, mm -hmm. I think it's super important mm -hmm. because the portion of this complacency isn't just about kind of like, sitting in the in the warm stew of your like religiosity mm -hmm. your pharisaical disposition mm -hmm. it's also the reality of like no all this matters like you need christ to actually be a parent because look around you the rest of society even though whatever they're not parents they're they're just trying to just kind of like pacify the kid put them off so they can just go and go do whatever that's not what Christ wants us to do with our children. And if you fall into complacency, right? We all have our moments. We all have our moments. That's not what I'm saying. But there's a difference between having a moment where you just, I need a break versus your whole life is about chasing the break. Yeah. You see the difference? Yeah. That you, all, you, can't, you can't really shake yourself of that without being intentional, right? You have to keep this, that's, that's how I've understood health in regards of if you want to be in shape, you got to always kind of be shocking the system because you can acclimate to your exercises super quick. You know what I mean? You've got, oh, to, yeah. shock, you've got to shock the system. And that's what I mean by these things. It's like I try to find these ways to shock the system. That's why it's like, you know, a little tip for everybody. You shouldn't like there's this weird from my experience, I'm sure – much more better people will say something different. But from my experience, I personally, and I'm not going to get into my prayer rule, but I personally have to have a shift after a certain point in time, because if I don't, it just becomes too easy to just kind of, because that's the other side of when you force yourself to pray, you can get to a place where you're just, you're automatic and it's just, you're knocking it out and there's nothing to it. You're not getting any benefit. If there well, isn't the, the discomfort, if, forgive me, Father. The discomfort has to be, oh, this is such an such an important principle, like that, because it it is definitely a bodybuilding principle, but it's in a lot of things. I think a lot of athletes know this, and my father told me this when I first started playing youth football, and he was like, "Listen, here's the deal: it's going to hurt every single time, whether you get hit or whether you hit somebody. Every play is going to hurt," yeah. he said, and it's gonna the whole time that you play. As 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 big as you get, as old as you get playing this, it's going to hurt every single time. And he said, if it doesn't, you're not going hard enough. Mm -hmm. He said, if it doesn't hurt every single and he's like, you'll be it. You'll get used to it mm -hmm. and you'll even learn that to enjoy it in a way because mm -hmm. you'll know that you'll have a sense of of. But the discomfort, you're going to feel discomfort permanently. When you're playing every single play, and if you ever let that level of discomfort get below, you've lost your position. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not going to win. Mm -hmm. the, the team that's going to win is the one that's willing to and is used to having the same level of discomfort every time. But that's true with bodybuilding. Like, the second your, your muscles will stop growing as soon as the discomfort stops. You should be as sore today after 20 years of, of bodybuilding as you were the first two weeks. Because that means that you've kept the level of discomfort and you'll just grow, 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 grow. It's you're using more weight. Mm -hmm. You're going harder. You're doing more sets. Mm -hmm. But there's a growth there. Sorry, Father. I just said it's no, just, you no, just kicked I mean, off something that was like, no, boom. It's, that's it's super. It, it's, re it's relevant. And that, that's what I'm trying to say is that, you know, this whole thing of like, 
And again, don't, I mean, someone's going to, that's great. And thank you. Thank you for mischaracterizing me. I appreciate it. It's actually very beneficial for me. Those of you who like, who enjoy doing it. So I appreciate it. But, you know, this whole thing with like, you know, I mean, yes, I'm a freak. I'm a weirdo. Like, but I'm not like sitting there just, ah, you know, like horror movies. But what I'm trying to say is like, I, instead of it just being kind of like a colloquial statement, trying to keep it real. I really, I really, you know, it's like, I'll tell you where I developed that habit, you know? And again, I pray that this helps people because I know for a lot of people, it's like, pre shouldn't talk much about themselves, but this is just what it is. Right. Cause I'm all, for me, I'm all about people realizing this is real. This is practical. This isn't like role-playing. I'm not a LARPer. You know what I mean? I'm not a LARPer. Like I have struggled very much so i've been open about this in the past with depression and self-pity that's why i talk about it so much and i keep it at bay because i know it's it's always going to be a demon that wants to get at me right that's why i picked up this habit i i I, that's where i picked up excuse me this discipline of like let me let me look let me stare horror in the face let me do that because it was one of the key things that pulled me out of self-pity and depression because self-pity and depression are fundamentally this gross looking at yourself, being focused on yourself, right? Self-pity, keyword is self. Self-love, keyword is self. And looking at the pain of others, which is greater than mine, was a way of really being able to get me out and be like, oh my gosh. And then it began to transform and it began to put flesh to the prayers and flesh to the theology of the church. And it wasn't just, you know what I mean? It was like, okay, it wasn't just about individual salvation because as a, as a, for years as an evangelical, you know, I had this Damascus road moment and it's carried me my whole life. Thanks be to God. But there were seasons where it's like, okay, well, you know, what do I do next? And there's seasons where it's like, well, you, you got to kind of acclimate and you got to get involved. And those seasons become difficult because it's like you're pulled out of yourself. You're pulled out of that experience that really transformed you for good reasons. But it becomes easy to become too acclimated. And you begin to really kind of just – Go with the flow on things in such a way that you lose sight of the reality of why we need a savior, of why repentance can't just be a one shot thing. So then when you're when you're awakened to that, that's where these things you start to need to develop discipline. Listen, guys, okay. I know I'm just not making sense. This is this No, you are father. No, 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 no. You are. You are to me. This is this is the history of monasticism, everybody. (laughs) Like, a lot of people don't know. I'm just going to tell you why monasticism started, right? Yeah, there was a political aspect to monasticism in regards of the first monastics when they understood that the empire was becoming friendly to Christianity and that there was going to be, you know, kind of like a watering down of some things. Absolutely, that's there. There. But it wasn't political in the sense of we understand it now where it's like this kind of like separate divorce thing. It was just life. It was just life. But the big thing they understood was that tension, that razor, that martyr's edge was going to be lost. So they they fled to the desert to pursue the bloodless martyrdom, the white martyrdom. And they that's where this ascetic aspect of of the life, the, the life in Christ began to develop in this sense. It was always there. St. John the Baptist was an ascetic. St. Elijah, the prophet Elijah was an ascetic. Moses was an ascetic. Like it's in our tradition, it's in there, but it's in those first early desert fathers and then subsequently developing the monasticism. It's like, that's where it comes out of is this understanding of like, I've got to keep my edge yeah, because this edge of how broken this world is, this edge of there is no justice here. This edge of there is pain here. This is what a lot of people are really lacking. And I just want to throw this out. I just want to throw this out because, you know, I'm going to, I have to kind of keep the edge here sometimes too. 
because I'm going to name a saint that a lot of people are like, oh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we can clickety-clack on, on the comments on this. But, you know, St. Maria Paris, like, for all that, you know, I, I, I know she's a problematic figure for some people, blah, blah, blah. But the reason why a lot of people don't really understand her what her writings is because they don't understand coming from having a broken life. They don't understand what it means to come from being morally bankrupt. The people who I, generally speaking, right, I'm sure there's exceptions, but generally speaking, like they kind of bristle at her are people who find themselves being like, they've never experienced what it means to really be on, on the underside of things. When you understand being on the underside of things, she begins to make a lot more sense because she's talking about this reality that the church was experiencing at the time of just, you know, and here's the thing. She's just speaking about the tail end of what St. John Kronstadt and St. John Maximin were, were talking about in regards of the kind of decadence and the complacency that happened to the church in Russia. That's why the communist, uh, that is communism was a chastisement. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So that is what that kind of complacency begins to look like on a national level. Right. And, and it happens when you begin to, I mean, this is why St. Elizabeth did what she did. Because when, when you, people become complacent, right, not only do they begin to lose any kind of potency in regards of their, like, religious practice to where it becomes regenerative and, and you know, salvific, but culturally it begins to take a shift where it's just like, you know, the beggars and all that stuff that's just looked at as like, well, you know, get your bootstraps, buddy. And it's like, okay, yeah, there's a, there's a point of that. But there's, you know, when you start going through certain um, Con manuals of confession there's this line in many good manuals for confession where it talks about did i disdain the beggar hmm. right the person who disdains the beggar is often the person who has never known or has lost sight that like you know what things happen in this world to people that isn't always their fault and oh, even yeah. if it is and even if it is how many how much have you brought on yourself and you still want god's mercy you yeah. see what i'm saying this or, is... or you received God's mercy, and that's the reason why you're not the beggar. <laughs> exactly. And, and this is why I think it's really important to keep that edge. It's like, I maintain this. If it wasn't just outlier pockets that understood this, but just more and more parishes and more and more Christians understood this, we don't need to have organizations. That's nice. That's fine. We don't need to develop nonprofits. That's nice. That's fine. I'm just talking like, an everyday parish. I'm talking about like, it shouldn't just be like the priests out there rah rahing it. And it shouldn't be, there's another problem. It's typically the people who are taking quote unquote, just Christian praxis and weaponizing it, turning to ideology. And that's what turns everyone else off. So in other words, what I'm saying is like, sometimes the people who get it are the people who like ruin it. Right. The mm. people who end up being social justice warriors and they they go way too hard in the paint to the left and they turn most people off to it. That's why now if we have conversations about this, there's so many people like, oh, you know, if you bring up anything in regards of like like you can't even use the word social justice because of all the crazy connotations that come with it. It's a loaded word now. Right. It's a loaded word. But if you take out like. If you if you take out the, you know, the kind of social justice warrior, you take out the leftist politics and economics, if you take out, you know, the the liberation theology of the Latin America, like if you take all that out and you just talk about Matthew 25, right? And like, did you feed me when I was hungry? Like, just let's just keep it to Christ, right? If you keep that in mind then what will happen is, is like we will receive God's grace because I remind everyone, yes, Sodom was judged because of her sins of, you know, sodomy, right? But when you read in the prophets, what does it say? I She was judged because of her um, pride of life, her abundance of bread, and refusing to outstretch her hand to her neighbor. That's what the scripture says why Sodom was judged. So, it's important and you look you guys can look it up. It says it right there in the prophets. I think it's in Ezekiel that it says this. So I would submit everyone to understand this. The 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 flagrant 
disgusting, you know, perversion that was in Sodom, which is disgusting and flagrant, and we shouldn't tolerate it, right? The it was the fruit of something, not the cause. The cause oh. of the cause of the wow. flagrancy, like the reason why you had these raging homosexuals trying wow. to kick down the door of Lot's house to rape these men, these angels. That was the symptom of what I'm talking about, not the not that, and not the and not the cause. That was and not, not the cause. The, like, it, it was it was the the result the result of it listen well, listen fa father yeah. father forgive me because this might be a good time because it's been a while but that you said that really affected me and that you've said to me even privately about this in catechism is you know people saying because because we're we're sort of on a in a in an area of alms giving at this point right mm -hmm. that what we're talking about mm -hmm. so it's like how much alms do you give and you you said well it's not an amount it's does it sting mm -hmm. like the, is it the correct amount is the amount that stings and it's That's like right. oh and and how somebody acts also what i've noticed about even with myself if you when you give so much that it stings it seems like you're actually often less likely to brag about it you're humbled it you're humbles humbled. you it it the stinging itself humbles you about the act which is in inc an incredible phenomenon because Listen. it seems like and 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 all this stuff about the wokies and all this and the you know you know whatever they're doing and uh, oh social justice warriors the one thing that you know about all of them is their activism doesn't sting that's right you can oh, you no. can feel that's it that's right yeah, they're not no, their their right. activism isn't stinging them it's not hurting them to do that's what they're right. doing that's right that's right that's if right. it did, did guys, it would look completely different. <laughs> did you guys see that video of the the lady? She was on TikTok or something like that, and she took a whole bunch of, or maybe it, was, it doesn't matter. She's on some social media and she's cleaning up garbage on the uh, beach, and then but someone else was taking a picture of them doing it, and she like gathered up a bunch of stuff in a bag and like took, and then just like tied up and left the bag on the beach and just, like, walked away. <laughs> like, yeah, that doesn't sting. That doesn't sting. Yeah, like, and, that like, doesn't sting. yeah it's yeah. and. Like that's, I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. Is is like, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's actually, doing. What's that, Father? Sorry, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Oh, well, and I, I think that is really that was something that struck me is how much I wish it wasn't as hard, uh, or how difficult it was for me, Andrew Funk, to do to work with the homeless. As I think, what I was trying to say is because I'm like. I'm not a horrible person. I'm not like the utter scum of the universe, but I am not nearly as nice or patient as I thought I was going into orthodoxy, like coming out now. I'm just like, I'm not nearly as kind. I played out these situations in my head of what it would be like to be a social worker. And now that I'm doing it, I actually, I can't tell you how many times I get a phone call and I know what it is. And I roll my eyes. I'm like, Someone's calling me from Jackson County Corrections. Okay, so this call is going to be awkward. It's going to be interrupted every three minutes. But this is a call from Jackson County. And it's like, this is going to be a whole thing. And then they're not going to have a pen and paper to write down the information I'm giving them. And then they're going to ask me to repeat it. And I'm just like, and so like instantly I'm like, okay, you have to remember you're not nearly as nice as you think you are. You think you're a really, really kind, patient person. Let's let reality actually speak for itself. And, and that call find, is about to sting. That call is about to sting. It's about, and not only that, it wounds my pride because I'm like, I'm getting mad. I'm getting frustrated at this person who's clearly not in his right mind. Otherwise, he wouldn't be doing the things that he's doing. You know, like just plain and simple. Call it mental illness, call it whatever, whatever, whatever. A normal person doesn't feel the need to shoplift and steal a bunch of crazy stuff to feed their meth habit or whatever. You know, that's not normal behavior. So clearly something is wrong, but I can't see that at that moment. I'm I'm pissed because this person is interrupting me in the middle of doing something else and I don't want to give them information. And Lord help me for the times I'm not as attentive and could have given them something different to help them. And I just didn't do it because I didn't feel like it because it was difficult at that time. So while congratulations, pat on the backs for nobody, because at best I scored a C or maybe a B on this test at best. 
nobody walks away shining. And if I do walk away and I think I'm shining, I've gotten an F because like, I think I did a really, really good job there. And I'm like, oh, well, look at me, Mr. Social Justice Warrior. I'm actually doing something while you guys are on Twitter talking about it. And I'm actually doing it. I'm like, okay, well, congratulations, buddy. You just really failed because now you're prideful. Now you're like, okay, yeah, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. I'm doing the thing that everyone talks about wanting to do, but I'm actually doing it, but I'm not actually doing it because I'm not doing it well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not doing it in a spirit of actually kindness and love. I'm doing it because someone is giving me a paycheck to do it. Like that's really at the end of the day, what it ultimately comes down to. So yeah, I kind of derailed this the conversation. Is the, this but... is the, no, this is because, because I think that this is the, the, that's the danger of complacency is that you don't even stay at the same place, right? You fall backwards. Yeah. Well, that's the, mean, on, the that's, only way that, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Paul. No, there's no neutral in the spiritual life. Yeah. You're either moving forwards or backwards. There's no neutral. Red, a red queen. It's a, it's a red queen pro, uh, process. There's, there's a perception of it, right? There's a perception that there's a neutrality, but it, it, but it actually isn't, right? Because it's so that space of rest right it's very quick and it moves from rest to regression like that right so yeah. the second that you recognize it's rest you're no longer resting you're regressing so it's so like, of course hillsong would go cor- hillsong would get corrupted oh. like to it's it's like of course it would have to happen yeah, it would have to happen Has because to. it's like, oh, but everybody feels good. Everybody feels great walking out of there. Has it's to. like, well, <laughs> we know where that's going. <laughs> it has to. It's funny because it's one of those things where, you know, I want to be very careful here because I don't want to. Again, I've, I've hopefully I get it. Anyways, uh, I'm making another journalize journalizing sweeping statement. But, you know, it's one of the reasons why so many nonprofits are sus, uh, you know, like. Because they don't have the built-in mechanism of like, you know, the kind of like at this point destruct. You know what yeah. I'm saying? At this point, like, like they don't have the mindset of like, okay, if we aren't actually looking to put ourselves out of business, we're doing this wrong. Yeah. Is it? Does this make sense? Right. You have to be working. Oh, it makes a lot of put sense. yourself out of business, and so many nonprofits don't do that. Right. Yeah. My, my brother wrote a forgive me, father. My brother wrote his uh, Ph.D. dissertation basically on on this. And it became a bit. It's, it's called down it down and out and under arrest. He basically embedded himself in in Skid Row, like mm-hmm. right as the homeless thing in downtown L.A. was becoming. This is he basically wrote about what the institutional corruption was going to be and the fact that it was going to blow up into a gigantic bomb like right oh, before. Man. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's 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 a great book. It was his PhD dissertation at U, at UCLA, but that was exactly what it what it was. Father was it's all it was all about the missions mm-hmm. that these missions that ha- they'd become these institutions down there, mm-hmm. and they'd become embedded with the government and the law enforcement in such a way that like law enforcement was snatching people up to put them in the missions because the missions were being paid per bed by yeah. the government. And so then it was this whole situation like it's this. It's the homeless. It's the um, someone. Put, uh, there's a term for it now. I can't remember what it was, but it's like the homeless industrial complex. Homeless industrial called. complex. Homeless so if you're industrial. a homeless shelter and you're not looking to put yourself out of business because it's like, no, 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 we're looking to grow. Oh, you're looking to grow the shelter. The, the, the missions down there are huge. Mm-hmm. In Skid Row, they're these huge, massive facilities. And they could, oh, we need to add more beds, add more beds, add more rooms, add more of this, add more. And it's like, no, 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 you're increasing the homelessness. That's <laughs> what are you doing? One of the things, when a problem is not going away, it's time to look at the very base assumptions. And one of the base assumptions I think that a lot of people overlook, and I have never been in this temptation, so God protect me when I do, please, because like, who knows what's going to happen? I have no idea. But when someone sidles up to you with a $250,000 check or whatever, and they're like, just keep doing your good work. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, okay, well, more money means more services. Yes, mm-hmm. I'll take that money. 
And then it just keeps happening and just keeps growing before you know what you're doing, the things that you're doing. I think the assumption you need to look at is more money equals good. Because a lot of times that's when things become diluted. That's a lot of times when people lose focus of the goal. When you've got the things, the stuff, the services, the thing. And then like not only that, it becomes a form of socialism. Because it becomes this whole idea of like, just show us numbers. That's all we need. And we'll continue to like subsidize you. We'll continue to give you money, taxpayer money Mm -hmm. to work on this problem, which all on paper, if you don't look about it for more than five seconds, looks good. But then you really start thinking about it. You're like, wait, what is the actual success rate of this? And how do you define success and why are you growing if you're helping with the problem? Well, the problem's that big. I'm not so sure it was. No, the the, the money makes it, the money is what makes the problem big. Is the the most destructive time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. ahead. Is the institution itself the major catalyst for this to continue to happen? Is this, this, this is, if someone is giving you a place to go, isn't that the ultimate form of enabling? Like, it's isn't that supply and demand? Well, if the services are there and you need to have people consuming the services, aren't you going to start creating consumers? Like, you, should don't you think? And that you maybe, have to, Am I creating people that need the services? Because here? you're right, and it becomes this whole like intertwined socialist capitalist thing. Because there needs to be supply and demand. Well, here's the thing. A lot, I mean, this is one of the things that. They never want to talk about this. And you only know this unless you've been in, in that world. People who are veterans, like not veterans like serving the country, although sometimes, yes, veterans are serve the country. But people who are like chronic homeless, they don't want to be in shelters. Like everyone knows, like you don't want to be in the shelter. You know what I mean? Why is that? Right. So like this is this is the thing that people don't understand in regards of there's a perception of these institutions or perception of problems. And then there's the reality of the problem. And I'm going to say this again, you know, it's not, it's not having to, it's not a forcing of this. When I say it complacency, because what happens is I, I know people with actually starting off with good intention, looking to Mm -hmm. actually want to address a need. Right. But what happens is complacency gets to set in. Right. And a complacency of like, hey, you know, kind of status quo, we've got a good rhythm. And it can even be, I don't think people understand how easy it is to become complacent. Remember, we've talked about how someone can get acclimated with being angry all the time. Yep. Right? Yep. Like, I don't think people understand how easy it is to get acclimated to something that just isn't, doesn't feel good. Abused people do it all the time. You know what I mean? Like, that's what mm-hmm. these, that's a weird codependency and um, Stockholm syndrome. All this stuff comes from because some becomes they 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 acclimate and then it becomes this complacency to which the the tension of the tension for fighting for your personhood in in an actual honest and, and good way that tension which doesn't feel good in certain situations you would much rather not fight for that and just kind of like become the doormat or become the enabler or become the whatever that begins everybody everybody hates me right (laughs) everybody yeah there was a there's a guy it's again was just talking about this but there is a there is a guy who lives here was just having a conversation with a friend of mine who's here about this individual and he's he's such a quirky guy and we were just talking about this that one of the things that he does, and my, my buddy was like, I don't even understand. One of the things that he does is he's just, perp- he will purposely offend people who are like otherwise his friends. Like he'll meet somebody, you're cool with them. And then the next time he sees you, he'll lead with whether it's, it'll be like racial epithets. He'll just, whatever the thing is that he knows will get you, he'll just do almost like he wants you to beat him up. Just like apropos of nothing, right? And he's, and, and, it's kind of like the vibe that I've gotten from him is, oh, this is a guy who I think was probably abused really bad when he was younger and just 
And you could tell he just has this put upon thing like everybody hates him. And he he almost feels uncomfortable if you don't hate him. Mm -hmm. It's almost uncomfortable to him if he's not feeling like the person he's talking to hates his guts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a weird place to be in. Yeah, it's and, but, he, but he's doing it too. He's right. He makes it happen. Right. Because he gets it. It's so like think of the word we use, but now really kind of break it down. Twisted. Yeah. Twisted. Right. Someone gets becomes twisted. And the reality is, is that this is what corruption does. This is what corruption does to people because ultimately that becoming twisted and um, it's, it's funny because it's, it's, it's a weird inversion of what we were talking about earlier in regards of there's an uncomfortableness that you want to be pursuing, right? But that tendency, right? That's what it looks like in the inverse in regards of like, no, no, no. That kind of discomfort yeah. is sick. Royal you, path. It's royal path here. You, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the one discomfort that we're talking about is one that's bringing about you opening yourself up to truth, to Christ, to change, right? For health, right? I like that word health right now. This, this feels good, using health as the kind of overarching word for what we're talking about. The inverse is sickness. That, so one brings health, one brings sickness, right? One brings an opening up and it's, it's learning to embrace the, the discomfort for the sake of health. One is an embracing of discomfort, which foments a sickness. Yeah. Right? And that, that oh, twisting, this is that's so that, good. That's Father, there's a, there's this phenomenon that happened. I think it's still going on with like the CrossFit people. It's mm -hmm. well known. They even have a mascot for it. It's called Rabdo the Clown. So like a lot of people uh -oh. who are in like the fitness. Yeah. A lot uh -oh. of people who are in the fitness scene um, have a, like always had this thing about like CrossFitters that they were kind of like masochistic, that they weren't really in it for health, but they were in it to like hurt themselves mm. and that they would have this thing. I forget. It's called Rabdo. It's short for something, but it's like a way over training to the point where you basically injure yourself oh. and that the pursuit of Rabdo has been something that's like a, a corrupt and dark and twisted part of the CrossFit scene. Huh? And that, that they're after and that, and, it's a thing that it's like Rabdo the clown. It's like this little mascot meme. What's he look like? Here, I'll, 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 I'll pull it up. But it's exactly what you're talking about of like the difference between health and sickness. That it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you're sort of because you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you're in the gym. You're doing this thing. Oh, I'm building muscle, whatever. But it's like, oh, yes. Like I said, yes, you're supposed to push yourself that one extra rep. But it's like, yeah, but not 10 beyond that. Because it's not, it's the one extra beyond that. It's not the 10 beyond that because right. the 10 is to injury. Yeah. You it's don't want to, sickness. you don't want to tear your bicep. <laughs> you don't want to. No. And, and that's what Rabdo is like. Your entire body is torn, is basically what it is. Hold on. I'll pull it up. Rabdo the clown. Rabdo. Rabdo the clown. You know, something to be that common. Here we go. CrossFit's dirty little secret. It's been going on for a long time. Let's see if we could rhabdo myelysis. Let me see if I could pull up a, an, an image here. Uh, some CrossFit gyms feature pictures of this puking clown. Let's see. Uh, here. Let's see if we could show it. Yeah. These puking, these puking, beating, uh, bleeding clowns. This, oh. <laughs> which is the opposite of health, right? So it's like that that you would be pushing this in a gym that's about fitness, cross fit, right? But you've taken it too far. Wow, um, Uncle Rabdo and Pukey. I just got a I just got a text. Uh, someone's listening. <laughs> It's the same thing old people get. Rhabdomylosis. Rhabdomylosis. It's, it's yeah. the same thing old people get when they fall and are stuck on the floor for days. You, your body starts eating muscle, essentially. Huh. Yeah, so so look at everybody's got these signatures here. Oh boy. Oh no, oh no, no, no. This is the that's that's the that's the workout. 
but I guess that people have signed this up here if it's happened to them. Wow. So it's like you've gone too far. Wow. You've gone too far. And I think that this is what we're talking about of when, when you talk about twisted. Because wow. it's obvious. And, and it's interesting that it's a clown, right? I mean, that it's a clown. And that it's like a thing. And yeah. this is the, yeah, so interesting. It's crazy. These principles, these principles are like they apply to because it's just objective reality. And 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 ultimately, I mean, right, like you know, it's it's one of the weird fruits of idolatry. You yeah. Know what I mean? mm. When you stop, it's asceticism for asceticism's sake, yep. as opposed to like for health. You're doing yep. it just to do it, and like yep. I, that's one of my problems. The few times I've had a few uh, really heavy emphasis on health, is I just get psycho. I just get psycho about it. And before I know it, I'm reading like the calories on my LaCroix to see if like, if that's going to like, well, it's, it's fast, and... fasting as versus anorexia. Yeah. Yeah. You could, I mean, fasting, fasting can, if you fasting taken too far is an eating disorder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, speaking of going too far, I think we're well over two hours. Yeah, we are. We that's are. okay. That's all right. Like that, like that's, but we had, well, we had to come to the Royal path. No, yeah. and we I had think, to come to the royal path. Obviously. I think it's a really good point because, like, I think that when there's this tendency to see the externals and just assume the internals are good, mm. and it's just like that's just a really easy thing. And there's this little, like, I don't want to say small, gentle voice. Maybe it is. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's just conscience. I have no idea. Um, but it's like that person just because like when you're first becoming orthodox, it's like just because that person is doing 50 prostrations a day mm-hmm. doesn't mean that they're good and does not mean just because they can quote the fathers just because, you know, da, 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 doesn't mean that they're in a good spot. And I think what father said earlier about just because you're doing 5000 Jesus prayers a day does not mean you'll, you know, achieve holiness because what I have found is it's actually not too hard to say 5,000 Jesus prayers a day. It's mm. very difficult to do it with love and correctly and to yeah. actually like focus on the good thing, like to actually sit there and actually like engage with it rather than just sit there and da, 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 you know, get, you got your mantra, mantra, mantra it. Yeah. You're just saying it, but you're thinking about, Man, I'm yep, that's can't right believe there. I'm doing this. You're saying it, but you're thinking about something else, right? Or you're thinking about how cool it is that you're doing this. And man, like I bet no one else at church has got a prayer rope like mine, you know, and you know, blah 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 blah. So that's the rope path. I would also say the thing that keeps me on my edge is body cam footage. There is a plethora of it on YouTube. Like that is and it's oh, the of, cop from the cops? Yeah. Yeah. And I have not run into anything that's too terribly salacious. Nothing that's like I would be terribly scandalized. The one thing is I saw someone get murdered and I was not ready for that. If I had known, but that, nothing. In the they, description. It's on YouTube. It was a, a, ex, a jilted ex-boyfriend who was trying to break into someone's house and it was their ring camera. And the dad came oh. out and shot him to death. And oh, it was very disturbing. Pretty- I was not ready for it. But right. most of the time, yeah. if you want to see like demonic like this one footage i'm not going to get into the description there's this one young woman who was it just sounded straight like a demon was just talking straight through her she's talking about how the cop's wife was cheating on him at that very moment just she's like she's he, you know and you know just like saying these awful thing awful mm. awful 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 things and he's like i'm not like demon possession. i'm not even married is what the cop was saying is like, I'm not, I don't have a wife. Like, this is not it. This is not a thing. Then the, she kept like coming to be like, where am I? Like, why am I in the back of a cop? And then she'd start screaming. They put, I had to put a spit hood on her and everything. Like, that's like the reality of like what, you know, and then you get the corrupt cops, like the body cam footage of people running out of their cop cars with their yeah. guns drawn already. So what are you saying here? You're saying like ground. body cam but it's just like what kills you what, what are you say that's this what, what keeps me on my edge. edge it's like oh, that's that oh, thing okay. that i watch it's incredibly gotcha. uncomfortable gotcha. to see like wow this just and it's always the most mundane places 
It's yeah. in like McDonald's parking lots. It's like outside of Home Depots. It's outside of like the apartments that look like every other apartment complex in America. It's banal. Like, the demons it's, are banal. Banal. It's, it's incredibly it's banal. Nice it's reference. Incredibly like um, mm-hmm. it it takes it's, away. Well, a pillar. It's bl- it, that uh, a McDonald's parking lot is about as bleak, banal, and boorish as you could possibly get. Yep. And yet, a yep. cop when I teen tried to just shut his door unloaded his entire clip into this kid unloaded like duh, 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 duh. and like the kid like tried to he's, he survived the kid survived but like just mundane boring it takes away a comfort like a, a, a like a like a pillar of comfort away to just be like this stuff is not uh since it's it doesn't make for good movies it's not yeah. like cinema, cinema, cinegraphic. I can't, I don't know what, Cinem- what the word is. Cinem- cinematic, cinematic. It's not cinematic. 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 It's not cinematic. It's very mundane. It's out of nowhere. Well, it's, it's senseless. And it's senseless. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And like, oftentimes these people, okay, we'll end on this. This is like the, a woman flashed a gun in a traffic dispute. This is in Colorado. Okay. And she flashed a gun. So the cops pulled her over, right? Yes. One of the cops, park on a train track oh, and, um they and they jump put out her in the car right they put her in the car they yes. jump out and while they're searching her car a train comes and hits that car that she is in yeah and it's just this total like it's it's not in this like like incredibly beautiful area or anything it's just this random train track outside this kind of small town in colorado and it's, i think it's a small town i i could be wrong she survived she's going to be messed up for the rest of her life, blah, blah, blah. But it's like this stuff, like it, it's just, it's, and then the media coverage around it is insane because like nobody talks about the fact that she flashed a gun. It's all focused on like the thing about like what the cops did wrong and everything. And it's like, yeah, that's all. Tr- anyway, it's this whole other thing of like, when you actually see it happen, it's like, this is not a movie. This is not like, this is not presented. This is all happens. And it's like people stutter People are weird. People are awkward. Even the cops don't know what to. Re- it's just insane. So, and it's usually there's not any like anything that I would be like, yeah, you should definitely avoid that because there's they never show anything or anything. So, anyway, it's late. I'm tired and I'm rambling. So we're gonna end this one. Um, thank you for listening or watching. Um, so we have a podcast or we have a playlist on Spotify. Whenever we mention music, I try and put it up there. I'm behind. Um, I just need to sit down and do it. It's Royal Path Playlist Podcast. Um, something like that. And then um, thank you, Jack. Jack. Mm-hmm. Yep. Jack, thumbnails. you're killing it. Love, love the thumbnails. Absolutely incredible. Um, we have a merch store, royalpath.store. Uh, we don't mm-hmm. see any of that money goes to the church and to the people who make the merch. Um, and then also, if you're wanting to reach out, you can reach out to me at Andrew at Royal Path dot network. I am very bad at, uh, at getting back to people at correspondence, especially email. I do not know why. I'm just very bad about getting back to people. If you want to contact Royal Path for a question that you want right on the show or something like that, contact at Royal Path dot network is the place to go. We have someone who mans that or yeah, that doesn't matter. And they, they're very good about making sure she's, she's excellent at getting back at people and stuff like that. So that's the place to go. If you want to reach out to me, you can just know that's a, that's part of it is that I'm bad at getting back to people. Um, and I think that is it. That's it. Thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.